Hello and welcome to episode nine of the Good Enough Mums Club podcast, where sometimes being good enough is best. Before we dive into the podcast, and this is just a heads up that sometimes we and our guest do get a little bit sweary, and I think this one particularly <laughs> is a little bit sweary. So if you have a little one around you, I think it's best that you do not let them hear these words. <laughs> My name is Emily Beecher. And I am Jade Samuels. And we are the hosts of the Good Enough Mums Club podcast. Every week we initiate a mum into the club and explore the complexities and realities of modern motherhood. You can join the club or find out more about the musical or future episodes of the podcast by following us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram by searching Good Enough Mums Club. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, rate and review wherever you listen. In this episode, we're chatting to composer, lyricist, actor, singer, all round hilarious human and amazing mum, Verity Quaid. Verity's working with us on the Good Enough Mums Club musical. And we cannot tell you how much we love the energy, passion and talent that she brings to the room. <laughs> Did we mention that she is hilarious? Our stomachs were sore after finishing this episode. Verity <laughs> talks with such warmth and humor about all things motherhood. And we do mean all things. We kick off as always with a special mum round of Would You Rather. What's your favorite space or venue to perform in? I mean, I have great acoustics in my shower. Um, <laughs> well, at least I think I do. <laughs> um, the, my, the favorite place I've ever performed is the Royal Albert Hall. That's just the, it's like my favorite venue, I think, to see stuff in too. I've done it as part of a sort of ensemble for, for proms, but I've, I've also had the pleasure of um, singing solo with, you know, Gershwin material with, with a, a 50 piece band on stage right behind me. And that's just, there's no feeling like that in the world, I don't think. Oh, yeah, amazing. just got little goosebumps. That sounds amazing. Yeah. When you actually have the band right with you on stage as well. So you have that cacophony of music surrounding you and lifting you up on its wings. It's ever so poetic of me, isn't it, for Tuesday <laughs> afternoon? <but yeah>. Um, <laughs> that's, there's something that quite special about that, I think. Amazing. Okay. Would you rather sleep in or have a nap? Oh, sleep in. No contest. <laughs> <laughs> well, the chances of me having either are very, very yeah. rare. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um what is your favorite role that you've ever played I was going to be really cheesy then and say mum but um because I feel like I'm playing that role just all the time <laughs> but I think um I got to play the mother superior and sister act I was alternate for a while and because it was a a role I could actually be an actress in and have my own autonomy over I had a, a fabulous time you have to watch a Disney movie five times a day Every day, forevermore. <laughs> what movie are you watching? Five times a day, forever. <laughs> <laughs> and ever. That, that is some kind of torture. I am going to go with my original childhood favorite, The Little Mermaid. Ah. My favorite, too. <laughs> Not just because she's a redhead. A bet. But also, probably like where I got all my unhealthy relationships. <laughs> A young girl from I mean let's be honest who didn't use a fork to comb their hair for a while after? I'm not gonna lie I'm not gonna lie the fork might have got lost in my mane <laughs> not dissimilar to you and mine was Aladdin because Princess Jasmine was the only one who looked anything like me in all of the princesses the rest of them were yeah but I love Aladdin Aladdin's great I think that, that Disney is so clever because it's obviously appealing to the children, but there's so much stuff that the kids don't understand that is for the adults. So when you watch them again as an adult, you're like, oh, this is actually brilliant from an adult's perspective. But he lit have you ever watched yeah. have you ever watched the um, Walt Disney film to where Tom Hanks plays Walt Disney? I haven't seen it, you know. So one of the lines in it is you have to get the adults and the children. So that's very astute well, there you go. observation. Yeah. Very okay. You're welcome on here all <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> for your delight and pleasure can you pee in peace no <laughs> at least not for the last two years certainly not no chance 
I don't even have a working lock on the bathroom door, so I literally have no chance. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I hate to tell you this, but I, like, I still can't. <laughs> like, I just, I just no, don't no. even. We haven't had doors closed in this house for ten years. Like, it's that real. It's. <laughs> I've even yeah. started instead of giving. Uh, my daughter a bath in the evenings I've even started just bringing her into the shower with me in the morning because <laughs> it's easier than trying to shower on my own yeah. um, okay your favourite song to sing you can have three wow um, so my go to one of the best songs ever written in my humble opinion um, that I started singing theatre to sleep with and she now calls it someday and knows all the words even though I've never actually and sat down with her to teach it is The Way You Look Tonight by Jerome Kern Aww. that's just I just think it's one of the most beautiful songs ever written so I will never tire of singing that I think God I mean how do you pick a musical theatre song that's literally impossible <laughs> <laughs> I used to sing a Candor and Ebb song all the time um, you, you know what it's now completely escaped me what the name of it is isn't that brilliant <laughs> I used to sing it for every single audition I ever went to Always got me a recall and always loved singing it. And now I can't even tell you what it's called. <laughs> Baby brain. <laughs> I literally can't tell you. And then, and, and then um, I think I would probably say Way Over Yonder by Carol King. Oh, nice. Those are my three. But I can't even tell you what the second one's called. I think it's got better in the title. <laughs> It'll come to you in the middle of a totally It'll, other it, question. Gonna, yeah, you're going to ask me a random question. And I'm going to it's called this! It's called this! So, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, so we're going to move on to our main questions now, Verity. What was your... I have to be serious. No, you definitely not. I think I'm incapable of it now. You've met us, Verity. You've met us. (laughs) What was your journey like to becoming a mum? Okay, yeah, so that was... It was tricky is is the best word I have to describe it. Um, I'm gay, so obviously being a mum was something I had to make a, a, a genuine decision about going on a process to to get to and we went for a consultation at a, at a couple of different clinics I asked the doctor first whether there was anything the NHS could do to help us become parents and and got a hard no I basically basically <laughs> got told that because at the time we thought we only needed artificial insemination and that's just not something the NHS offer full stop um so then we went for consultations with some private fertility clinics and and went through the sort of initial testing processes they have with their consultations and it turned out that my fertility was pants so with that, we were sort of on a path then already. And if I'm honest, I don't think I ever really took time to process that bit of information that that my fertility was rubbish, that I needed to have IVF. I just sort of, I never really processed emotionally what that meant. I just knew then that people were telling me, so if you want to become a mother, this is the process you have to go through. And then I was suddenly on the beginning of that path and just following instruction. That's kind of how it felt to me. Mm. And we had had consultations with a couple of fertility clinics and we chose one that has a slightly different way of doing things because they had the best statistical outcomes. And as it was going to cost us huge amounts of money that we didn't really have in the first place, um, I thought, well, I'm going to use the one that has the best statistical outcomes in the hope that we only have to do this once. And the, and the thing that they do differently is they do this, this pre-testing and pre-treatment, um, which is to do with things called cytokines, which affect your uterus. And the guy that that set up this particular clinic, I'm not going to mention names because you know there are other fertility clinics available, whatever. But <laughs> but he he did he did he has this scientific <laughs> research that shows that if you have a, a, your cytokine level is above a certain amount, basically if you then insert an embryo um, into the womb, your body thinks it's an alien and kills it or a disease and kills it. So obviously the IVF mm. fails almost immediately. And my cytokine level, unlike the rest of my immune system, seems to. <laughs> They seem to be sky high and working brilliantly well. So, um, so I had to have months and months and months of of a drug treatment every month to try and bring this level down, which basically meant my immune system was shot. I got a lung infection, with, which I'd never had. I got temporary asthma as a mm. result, which I'd never had. Wow. I had eye infections galore and all sorts of things. Just and I just felt hideous all the time, pretty much. And still, this level wasn't coming down to where it needed to be. So, sort of eight nine months of that, and I was. Um, kind of a bit distraught at the thought that I might not might not even be worth me trying to have IVF I might not even get to that point and um the last you know my partner and I were just talking about that maybe we needed to to have a break and think about things a different way and then I realized that I hadn't heard back from the clinic about my latest round of the results from my latest treatment 
So I rang them and that very morning um, they said, oh, I, I need to go and check with the doctors. Let me get back to you. I got a phone call back about half an hour at work and they said, right, you need to come in immediately. You need to start today. So from going from in that one morning, I'd gone from, I'm never going to be able to even try and have IVF, let alone have a baby, to come to the clinic now. It's going, go, 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 go. Um, and I was at work. And so I had to go and find my sort of, the, the person, you know, my my my, le- my line manager and say, um, I know this is really weird, but I just need to leave. <laughs> I've just got to go. <laughs> I can't really explain it all now. There's not really time. <laughs> but I just have to go. You know, classes of students left bereft for teacher, wondering, <laughs> wondering, what, did, what, wasn't Verity just here? What, what just happened? So I disappeared in a zoom of smoke. Um, and that was that. I started the IVF treatments and, you know, injections and drugs galore tests every day. I had to go, basically, I was getting up at five o'clock every morning to go into the IVF clinic before work, have blood tests. And then they would tell you how much of which drugs you needed to inject yourself with each day. And I was injecting myself in a horrible toilet at work um <laughs> you know it was it was pretty pretty intense for that period of time and then um I was very 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 fortunate that it worked the first time what you say fortunate after yeah. how many nine <laughs> months of drugs and stabbing yourself like some sort of fertility junkie in the bathroom and... yeah and of course we'd spent I don't know how many thousands of pounds yeah. before the IVF treatment even started so you know, every time you set foot in a private fertility clinic, it costs you money. Every blood test, every piece of information. Um, you know, we're not people with with money to burn. So, so that was yeah, it was a journey certainly. <laughs> Put it that way. I then also had a really tough pregnancy where I had two massive bleeds, oh, and, and they thought I'd miscarried both times. And the first time was I was it was literally I was about twelve weeks pregnant. And it was I'd been for New Year's Eve to visit friends in Brighton. We'd been to New Year's Eve. And on New Year's Day, we just came back and I was just sitting on the sofa. And all of a sudden, I felt a bit funny. And I looked down and there was blood on the sofa. I went to the toilet and it just sort of, this is a bit graphic. I do apologize. No, no, it's fine, honestly. (laughs) Close your ears. It just sort of gushed out of me, like completely. Yeah, um, really like gushed out of me. And of course, it's it's New Year's Day. And um, (laughs) my partner, Catherine, came to the bathroom door and was sort of flapping flapping and I was sitting on the toilet going there's loads of blood there's loads of blood there's loads of blood she had a phone in her hand and she couldn't even remember her own passcode to get Bless into her that. phone to call anybody <laughs> so I was telling her what her passcode was to get into her phone um and sort of rang 111 I think initially and um and they ordered an ambulance for us and the paramedics got there and, and had mm. to ex- and they asked me not to get rid of uh, clean anything and they had to examine everything and they said you know obviously we're all aware of what's probably happened here. So sort of prepping me for that all the way along. And you get to the hospital and it's New Year's Day, so they've got reduced staff. There's nobody there. <laughs> and I had to wait for about six or seven hours to be seen. Um, and I was seen by a junior doctor who'd never dealt with this kind of thing before. There was nobody in the gynecology oh. department. On There was nobody present. So there was nobody that could give me a scan to tell me if I had actually miscarried or not. And I basically got sent home again and told to come back to the clinic at eight o'clock the next morning to find out whether I was still pregnant or not. Oh, so, no, Verity. Yeah, it was kind of traumatic. Oh, my God. <laughs> At a time where you can't, like, self-medicate either. No, there's oh nothing. Like, you just, you know, and we, I, you were supposed to go home and what, we're supposed to sleep? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the yeah. time we got home, it was 2 o'clock Rest, in the morning. don't be stressed. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it was, it was was pretty hideous. And the second time I was hospitalised for, for, for three or four days because they needed to keep an eye on me, basically, and, and check. Um, and also then I also got really bad SPD, which is this thing where your God. body releases too much relaxin and your hips kind of float, don't really work Ooh. properly. So I was on crutches for the last 10 weeks of my pregnancy. Um, yeah, I had, I had a great time of it. My body loved it, clearly. <laughs> we haven't even got to the birth. I was just going to say, and then she had to arrive. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't much fun either. <laughs> Sounds like an absolute party. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it won't surprise you to know that the birth was not a kettle of fish, as they say. <laughs> yeah, so basically my <laughs> I was two, two, three weeks overdue maybe, and, and I'd had two or three sweeps by this point, which we all know oh, Jesus, if we've had them, oh. ladies, are far from enjoyable. One of our previous guests said it's like being fingered, but there's no pleasure in it. <laughs> <It's really laughs> I, I have never been fingered like that, thank God. <laughs> You know what I mean? It reminds me of, I mean, sorry to be too graphic. It reminds me of like when you're 13 and 14 and you start going your first sexual experiences and boys just do that. And you're like, ow! Yeah, it's like Edward 
liquid scissor hands is down there, you know. Like someone with tree trunk for fingers. <laughs> yeah, like just take a deep breath. And, and try and relax. And you're thinking, relax, relax. It'll hurt less if you relax. Oh, will it? That's nice. How am I supposed to do that then? <laughs> But the first time, I totally thought I wasn't going to feel it. The first time I was like, okay, yeah, totally. I'll just lay back. You'll just do this. Th thinking about it, yeah. it's your fucking cervix, right? And it's like basically holding the baby and everything else in. So it's like this tightly stretched elastic band. But yeah, she was like, oh, just relax. It'll be. I'm sure it's fine. They've probably done it. it a million times. <laughs> but for you, it's this is not something that you've experienced. Maybe it doesn't hurt their fingers, but it sure is a lot of time. I do <laughs> think that that's what, like, one thing, like, when with motherhood and giving birth, it's so intrusive. It is. Your body is literally, mm. your body is literally hijacked in every single way, shape, or form. And I had had a lot of speculums up there because I'd had a lot of early scans and investigations <laughs> through the IVF process. Yeah. So I had had a lot of stuff shoved up Manuni for that period of time. And, and still the sweep was more invasive. Oh my yeah. God, that's awful. <laughs> yeah. So I'd had two of those. And then I, because I, I was resisting an induction. Not really sure why. I think because my NCT classes, they were so against they it. They scare you. Yeah, I was terrified of induction. I think they were just so that like it was it was so seen as a really negative thing, like bad for the baby or whatever. And, and so I just I, I, in my head, I, I didn't want to be induced, and I was resisting it. So I had these two sweeps, and then I, I was booked in for the induction on the Sunday, and on the Saturday morning, I'd just had my bowl of cereal and gone back to bed for a lie down, and I had this really weird pain, and I just sort of had to swing my legs gingerly because of my SPD <laughs> swing the legs over the side of the bed and put my hands against the wall that the bed's next to and I was like oh that was really weird it lasted about 30 seconds and went away and Catherine do you think there was a contraction I said I don't think so there was no sort of squeezing or bearing down or any of these things that you're told to feel it was just kind of this weird pain shooting upwards mm. from my fanny it was kind of weird mm. and then lo and behold 30 seconds later it happened again <laughs> And 30 seconds after that, it happened again. Wow, they were quick. <laughs> she came quick. That's fast. Every 30 seconds. Um, so we called the maternity ward and they went, oh, um, well, are you, are you sure it's, have you timed them? Are you sure, are you sure it's happening that No, swiftly? just randomly picking numbers out of the sky here, lady. Just for BAM. You better, you better come in then. And because <laughs> I'm the one that drives, we couldn't drive. So we had to get in a taxi. I had to find a taxi. And I was, you know, I had this TENS machine that a friend had given me. <laughs> so funny now when I think back on it I was sat on a towel in the back of the taxi just in case the taxi driver was this really unflappable <laughs> you know I, I was I was mooing I, I was a mooer <laughs> so every time it was like <gasps> it was a real rocket taking off move and um <laughs> <laughs> Catherine didn't Poor know what to do driver. with herself. The cab driver, I don't know, he was just totally fine about it all. Well, that's my memory of it. God knows if that was the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Prof what a consummate professional, though. It's I mean, not my business. No. Nope. Whatever's going on back there isn't my business. My job is to get this woman where she's going. She's paying me for that. <laughs> So I'm not going to get involved. What a fucking pro. What a hero. Give that, man a, hero. Give that man a round of applause. I can't He's... remember if we tipped him, but I hope we did. <laughs> he was just glad that you didn't get, you know, fluid all over his seats. And that I was... think he was, inside, he was probably just thinking, I've just got to get her there before the baby comes. Yeah, I've just got to get her. I am not delivering this baby. This is not my job. This poor fucking taxi would never be the same again. <laughs> And I was sitting there trying to get this tense machine fucking working on me, <laughs> thinking I just this will help me. I just need to get this tense machine giving me some electrical pulses. That'll help, won't it? Yes. <laughs> and of course, I couldn't get oh it working. God. I tried no. changing the back. I just couldn't get it working. But it gave me something to focus on, which I think was a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> And we got there and there I was standing in the maternity waiting room on my crutches, oh, moving every 30 seconds. Parenting. And there was this little family with a young boy <laughs> that were clearly there waiting to see somebody that had a baby. And I just remember this little boy's face looking up at me <laughs> as if I was, you know, I was some sort of hideous monster. Tell you, no, seriously, that's the best contraception for kids. Give them the, real, <laughs> give them the reality. Yeah, put some on it, love, because this could be you. <laughs> this, is your, this is your future, Bab. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And they must get so many people going to that maternity ward too early in labor, right? Mm. So I think, you know, we sort of signed in at reception and, and she, you know, we did these, answered these <laughs> questions and she filled in the form and it felt like it was taking forever. And every 30 seconds I was, <laughs> you know, um, 
And I was just standing there on my crutches. And Catherine was like, do you want to sit down? No, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> standing up on the crutches, all good. And I think it would have taken forever if a midwife hadn't happened to have come out of the labor ward door and, and seen me standing there and heard me mooing and just said, are you all right? And I literally couldn't speak at that point. And so she went, I think we better get you to a room and have a look. And I was 10, <laughs> I was 10 centimeters. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Within the first half an hour. I think I was six when she first had a look at me. And then I was, you know, it was happened so quickly. Was that oh so, what, what, because this is the thing, isn't it? Because people say, oh, you've had a quick labor. It was all over quickly. Whoa. But you had, <laughs> this is what I mean. It was so intense. Well, my labor was like yeah. 60 hours. But oh, 60. Was, oh. yeah. yeah. Mine was 54. But, wow. but, so we say this. But I had a, st- a steady, gradual growth up to that point. So you went where I went in 60 hours, yeah, I think, in 30 I think minutes. That's, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the thing. It was super intense. And I think that's what caused me problems, you know, in the latter stages of delivery, because my body was absolutely knackered from the intense, never having yeah. any relief, basically. Yeah. Um, and of course, I had to be in, in this worst position for my hips, which was on my back with my legs apart. Oh, no. Um, and also, they had me hooked up from a heart monitor from the word go. Oh, they fucking did that to me. It's the worst thing. I couldn't thing. move around. Like, I wanted to move. And they recommended that I have an epidural because it was happening so quickly. So they sort of got the anaesthetist in there quick, smart. It did nothing. It sort of, I think, vaguely half numbed one side of me, but I could feel everything. Yeah, because it takes a while for the epidural to kick it in, doesn't so it? It happened so quickly for me that it just didn't have time to have yeah. an effect, you know, at the right stage. Um, I'd forgotten this until, you know, Catherine reminded me of it when Theo was about two weeks old. Oh, yeah, you vomited as well. I was like, did I? Oh, I vomited too because they made me eat. They were like, you need to get your strength up. When I was in, I think by the like day two, they were like, okay, you need to eat. You need to eat. And I was like, okay. And then (laughs) then after they broke my water, I was like, that's when everything for me ramped right up. And I was like, what the fuck have you done? And literally I walked into a shower. They're kind of helping me stand because I'm like you having crazy contractions. Just vomit. Just vomit. I'd forgot. I mean, I just, there's little details like that that I'd completely forgotten in the yeah. process. Little details. Like massive vomit. Details, like vomiting. No, but it's per- I vomited and I had like profuse diarrhea for about 12 hours and I was just pooing oh constantly. But it's the purge. Yeah. It's the purge. The Your body's like, right. Yeah. Like, everything's getting out now. <laughs> But I know, ironically, I was really happy that I'd, I'd, I'd had poos before. No, genuinely, because my mum pooed on the table when I was born. And I was like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, imagine doing a shit in front of a room full oh, of people. Yeah. She's going to kill me for that. Sorry, mum. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but you're worried about the weirdest things. Like I had carefully selected clothing that I was going to wear. <laughs> How on brand, Emily fucking Beecher, how on brand. <laughs> I had an outfit I was going to labor in because I didn't want anyone seeing me naked. Cut to, I swear to God, <laughs> me on the floor, all fours, ass to the door, yeah. in walks the cleaner. I did not give a I shit. I bought a special loose like, flowy yeah. nighty thing that I thought I was yes. going to be wearing. And I was like, just get everything off me. I don't want anything touching my skin. <laughs> Least of all you, Catherine, stay away. <laughs> I actually, I bit my ex in Did one you? of my contractions. <laughs> Fuck I yeah. had my head buried in his chest and I just, I didn't even know what it I just bit oh. down. <laughs> and I was just like, you poor guy had this bruise. But I was just like, no, everything I thought I wanted. I had all of these world music. Listen, I had spent that two weeks while she was overdue building the best playlist you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Honestly, and I never even, yeah, just never even got to song number one. What are you talking about? I never even got the speaker out of the bag. No yeah. chance. Well, no, they put it on and I was like, what is this? I don't want it. I don't want this tribal nonsense. <laughs> Catherine was trying to drip feed me little sips of Lucas Aid as well. I was like, get away from me. I just leave me alone, everybody. Oh. It was awful. The thing is, though, you do these birth plans, right? Which they're like, everything doesn't go according to plan. <laughs> Do you want candles? Do you want sort of like Tibetan monks humming in the background? <laughs> Keep it calm. Be interested in having a second because oh you'd God. just be like, look, I want to survive. That is what I want to do. Well, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I genuinely don't think my body would go through it again. I, I, I mean, I'd love to do it in the next couple of years. And genuinely, that's my plan. I want to survive this. I wouldn't, if they tried to strap that heart minus a yeah. thing to me, I'd be like, you can fuck off. I am not lying to you. I'd even listen to loads of quite hideous birth stories from friends of mine that I'd had. You know, I'd heard about people ripping from front to back and I'd heard about all sorts of things. And and I, nothing can prepare you for, for going no for going through that process. Just nothing. Well, because it's 
such a physiological sure. exper- experience giving birth. And that when people talk to you about it, it's, they can only talk to you about the theory of the physical, not the fact that you really are in a place, like your brain goes to a place just with the entire pain mm-hmm. yeah. and sensory overload yeah. of the experience. I definitely don't feel like I was actually within my body. I mean, I was feeling everything. But my brain didn't feel like it was connected no, to that somehow. Completely. I was almost no. floating and watching in the room somehow. So yeah, yeah, it's kind it, of weird. Distance, isn't it? The only way you could survive something like that is for your body to go, okay, I'm just going to distance you a little bit from that. So yeah. You don't fall apart. <laughs> it should. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, gas and air, what's the point? The, the only thing it was worth, worth it for for me was something to chomp down mm. on. Like literally the thing that goes yeah. in your mouth that you suck it from. I was like, mm. <laughs> like a dog with a bone. <laughs> Just chomping away on it. Yeah. Should we ask some more questions in a minute? <laughs> I think we should. I'm, I'm just like, I'm literally crying with laughter here. But um, <laughs> girls, I didn't even get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I know. She's not even here yet. Yes. What was the uh, eventual arrival of Thea? Oh, Christ. Well, basically, they said, look, we're going to, um, her heart rate had been dipping every time I contracted. <clears throat> so when it, it got to, to time to push, they said, we'll give you an hour. And if, and if, you know, we'll have to help you after an hour, basically, if we don't have any success. So I like, I like, you know, to be given a target. <laughs> I'm quite a competitive person. Sport oriented. You know, I'm quite a competitive. I, I played a lot of sport. I still play some. I'm quite competitive. I thought, right, okay, we can do this. You've given me a goal and you've given me a time limit. <laughs> and then the, the midwife was awesome. She was with me through the entire thing because obviously it didn't last that long. <laughs> it didn't last very no long. shift change there. So... <laughs> So basically she was coaching me through it in a way that I would imagine a, a sports coach would do. That's how I sort of felt at the time. Right, you can do this. You just need to do it next time it comes. You know. So I was there I was. I pushed her about 45 minutes and then her heart rate started to really rise. So they said, we're going to have to you know, get her out a bit more quickly. We're going to have to help you. So um, the consultant decided that Von Tuss was the way forward and episiotomy. So we had a bit of an episiotomy and a Von Tuss. So Von Tuss is is essentially a suction cup that the the, the consultant goes in and um, attaches it to the baby's head and then pulls to help the baby come out. And episiotomy is obviously when they snip. I had both to make those the as whole well. Bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> to stop you from tearing. <clears throat> supposed to stop you from tearing, isn't it? It's supposed to stop you. Yeah. We're just we're just going to do a nice neat little cut with some scissors, literally some surgical scissors, yeah. to try to try and avoid you ripping. Yeah, you got the suction cup on and it came off with a big <gasps> sound. I was like, that 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 does not sound good. <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention that my hip pain because I was in the worst position was so bad it was actually it felt worse than the contractions. So every time a contraction stopped, my hips would start absolutely. Oh my god, it was agony. That was what I was screaming about. I didn't scream about the contractions at all, but I would scream in between them because the hips started hurting so bad. It's funny now, isn't it? Yeah. The von Tuss, obviously, the second time the von Tuss went onto the head, um, <laughs> I'd managed to get her all the way. To, like the head was right there, so it, it, it was in a good position, I think. Um, so that did that did work. Um, the, she had also pooed inside me. I forgot oh. to mention that bit as well. Like literally, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Meconium, yeah. So. That was also contributing to why I had to do it within a certain time limit. And um, so she came out and then the problem, the mood in the room changed after that, actually, to, to sort of a, I was feeling OK about life, apart from obviously the hideous amounts of pain I've been going through. I was feeling OK about life, but they didn't give her straight to me to hold because they had to go and check her. Someone was in to check her for meconium and flush her out. And the mood in the room kind of changed. I could tell the consultant was a bit concerned about something. I remember saying to him, am I bleeding? And he just sort of looked up and went, mm hmm. And that was all he didn't, you know, this guy that had been very sort of engaging with me in the eyes, very kind, very explaining things nicely. And then all of a sudden he wasn't really engaging at all. And I thought, oh, this doesn't feel like it's going very well. And then they press the button and 10 people come in and, <clears throat> and one, one, another consultant, female consultant's job was essentially to punch and knead me in the stomach. And she kept saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And I kept saying, it's okay. It's just, you're just doing your job. <laughs> You're just doing your job. I totally understand. <laughs> she was punching and kneading me in the stomach, trying to get my uterus to contract. Um, <clears throat> there was another nurse or midwife whose whose job was seemed to be to co- coordinate the room entirely. And there was this really existential moment where I, <laughs> this out of body thing, where I, at one point I sort of stopped the room and went, I'm really sorry, everybody. Can we just stop for a moment? <laughs> because I, I knew, I felt like I didn't, I wasn't really feeling the pain so much at this point. I think I was so outside of myself that I, I, I wanted, 
I knew something bad was happening. And so I stopped the run. Can we just stop for a moment? I, just in case I don't get a chance to say this later, I want you all to know how amazing you are and I'm really grateful for all of you. Oh, God, <laughs> Verity. <laughs> I mean, my mother would have been so proud. <laughs> you know, manners first. So... <laughs> So I just stopped the room to say thank you. And this woman who was coordinating went, that's great. Thank you. But you need to shut up now. And then carried on. <laughs> Everyone carried on. One person's job was to just count how many gauzes came out of me after mopping up blood. Um, oh, yeah. Basically what happened is I lost three liters of blood, which is more than half the blood you have in your body. They just couldn't stop wow. it. Um, and I was a shade away from having an emergency hysterectomy. They managed to stop it with, they went through all the list of interventions, about 20 of them. And the 19th one worked. So that in, that involved um, me being under general anesthetic and surgery and having a silicon balloon, essentially. Sh- uh, well, firstly, they had to manually clear me out. I won't explain what that yeah. means, but it was not pleasant. If you ever watched All Creatures Great and Small when you were younger and you watched James Herriot delivering a calf, <laughs> that'll give you a good idea of what that means. <laughs> and then um, they put in a silicon balloon inside you and fill it with water and then pack you full of gauze. And that was the thing that worked oh, so that my God. body still felt like it had a baby inside it essentially that's what stopped the bleeding um and then they let it down three days later but yeah so there you go that you know convoluted but it was a bit it was a bit of a it was a bit of a time yeah (laughs) so how long was it before you got to hold her Uh, it was probably a good six or seven hours i think because I, I, the first thing I remember saying when I was coming around from the anesthetic was, can I hold her? Can I hold her? And they wouldn't let me because I was too groggy. Um, so, yeah, so she didn't have the skin or, or, or a feed or anything from me for, for, for quite a little while, you know. Um, so that was pretty hard. Mm. It was pretty hard. Because that's the moment everybody thinks, you're, you know, that's your dream moment, right? That when you're hanging in there. Yeah, the that you, get, you get that little bit at the end. Else. Yeah. I still feel like the first time I held her was very special to me, but but it was... Yeah. She was perfectly clean and, <laughs> you know, she'd been, well, actually, <laughs> could there be something else to tell you? But yes, you won't believe it. There is. Of course, what had happened, they'd had all those people in the room and their focus had all been on me once they knew Thea was okay with, you know, the meconium and everything. The we all, everyone came with me into surgery. Catherine was left holding the baby oh. in this room of carnage on her own oh. and they'd not even removed the scissors from the umbilical cord so she was there with her scissors hanging off her umbilical cord and Catherine was just holding her going um um on her own in this room of you know not nice things so oh, that was God. I think I think a pretty horrible traumatic time for Catherine as well to be honest yeah I can imagine it I yeah. was going to ask how did that affect Catherine because you lived through it but she physically saw it all what was the effect of that yeah I think um well, I think she was pretty traumatized by it. And of course we had, you know, I was quite ill for a few months afterwards mm. and we ended up in hospital with Thea when she was a week old because they thought she had sepsis. So we were in hospital with her for a week and, and she had to have a lumbar puncture and all sorts. So there was a lot of trauma, oh I think, attached to those first yeah. few weeks for, for, for everybody, including, you know, um, yeah. other family members who, who were, no, no one ever felt sort of settled or secure for quite a long time um, in everybody being okay and just in, purely in that sense. So that took yeah. quite a long time, I think, for us to just all be at home and kind of feel okay with something terrible not going to happen, maybe, mm. I think. Yeah. It took a long time. She was a miserable baby for 11 months. So She lived through a lot. <laughs> she, she, she went through a lot, though, bless Can't blame her, her can you? Can't blame her. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Like, with rare, like I had a Vantus and um, an episiotomy. And you just, it's, you're constantly thinking, I'm going to split my stitches. I'm going to split my stitches. You just, it's really scary. Oh yeah, that was not, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I tore and I think I felt that all the time. And I had had a lovely friend of mine who, who <laughs> had given me this advice to, to get some aloe vera gel and um, some sanitary pads, soak the sanitary pads in aloe vera oh. gel, put them in the freezer. Ooh. So that, of course, by the time I got, I mean, this was before the, and anything had, ha- you know, before the labor and birth had happened. And by the time I actually got to the point where I was at home with the newborn baby and after we'd come back out of hospital, et cetera, et cetera, that I couldn't even remember. I didn't even remember I'd done <laughs> <laughs> Months later, you're finding sanitary pads with aloe vera in the freezer. What the fuck is this? Thinking, what is this? <laughs> Your parents come over to stay at the house and look after you for a bit and try and find something in the freezer and that's what they find. Oh, God. So there you go. Yeah. It's just funny, isn't it? <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about what the hardest thing about motherhood was for you, but Jesus Christ. 
Oh, that, yeah, the hardest thing about motherhood in general. I think there's lots of hard things about motherhood, aren't there? I think certainly the losing of yourself, mm. which is not a regret, but is something you have to come to terms with. I also, I think the self-doubt probably. Yeah. I think the self-doubt is maybe what I found the hardest. Um, constantly questioning whether you're mm. doing the right thing. And I'm not someone that read loads of books. I had all the books. I just never read them. <laughs> People kept giving me the books. I don't know what they're trying to say. People are still giving me books on how to be a good mother now. Um, uh, but I think, I think I was just never that person. I was always kind of a bit more, oh, I just go with it, see what happens. But then, of course, when you have that approach, you're constantly just, well, maybe you are whatever approach. I was going to say, I think if you read the books, it doesn't necessarily make it. Yeah. But they they said, I need to do this for this to happen. And this hasn't happened if I do this. So it can make you even the neurosis even worse. Or they contradict each other. And you're like, but this book said I should do this. Well, yeah, they all say different things. (laughs) Oh, terrible. I think it is just a never knowing if you're making the right decision or doing the right thing. I just, yeah. it's that thing, isn't it? That constant thing of, oh, is this going to be the thing that puts my kid in therapy? You're constantly, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I figure it, there's going to be something. So, you know, I might give her a few things she can choose from. <laughs> <laughs> Play the game. Should we write it down on cards now? And then when she's yeah, eight, yeah, yeah. when she's <laughs> 18 and she goes to therapy, say, come on, Bab, which, what, what was it? <laughs> That's gonna make that's gonna make a brilliant homemade cars against humanity one day. <laughs> it's it's interesting there being mother of mothers of, mothers of daughters that are quite similar to us. Emily and might both mm. feel this. You just got this mirror constantly up in your face, haven't you, Emily? Of Jesus yeah. Christ. Well, nobody needs that, do they? No. That's just a little bit. It's a bit too much. A bit of reflection we don't really no, need to do. <laughs> like I'm re- I'm really, really close with my mum. Like there's only seventeen years between us, so we're more like sisters as well. Wow. So it it that dichotomy of, oh Jesus Christ, I really fucking put you through it. But then you see, but you could have done this better. So you're very judgmental and non judgmental mm. both at the same time. Yeah, it's all with a level of sort of realisation, mm. isn't it? You sort of suddenly realise how things went down a certain way when you mm. were a kid I guess I think would I have made decisions any better sometimes mm. yes sometimes no if I'm going to be really honest with you mm. and then that's part of what exactly what I was saying because in the moment you're making those decisions it's all well and good with a bit of hindsight, hindsight of, oh my mother did this so if this ever comes up for me I think I'll do it a different way but when you're in the moment who bloody knows I've said yeah. so many things that she says and I'm like fucking hell there's Brenda <laughs> do you know <laughs> so many it's really it's so strange so strange very odd. Very, very odd. So, um, Verite, what yes, is something about motherhood that you never expected? How bad her breath can smell sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> very true. They're gross. <laughs> they are fucking disgusting. Like, it's a, it's a baby. It's supposed to smell of, like, lavender and roses all the time. But her breath honks <laughs> sometimes. Really? Halitosis of a dog. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that was pretty unexpected to me. I also think the genuine lack of brain function. Mm. Like that was, I, I just, I didn't believe, I didn't understand how how that would affect me. But I am, I feel like I'm running on about 30% brain function most of the time. <laughs> and whether that's just intense, you know, sleep deprivation or that your priorities are different and your mind's on different things. I don't know, but I definitely feel reduced function of the brain. That and both. But Emily always yeah, says yeah. it gives you this amazing ability because you know that you're not going to get, you're not as great at things that you used to be and be able to do things the way you used to do them. You can get shit done quicker because you're like, right, I know I've got this reduced capacity, so I just need to get yeah, this done. Yeah, I think you're right. i got 10 minutes. Watch yeah, me. how much can Eat I fit into room. that time? Yeah. Right with one hand, <laughs> one hand, because you're carrying Make a baby, a spaghetti or doing something with the other, yeah. and uh, text a friend. Make sure they're okay. <laughs> completely, yeah. completely. Yeah, that's really true. And actually, I think even when you have those moments of respite, like I'm clinging on, like all hell at the moment to the lunchtime nap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm re- really it trying to still down. persevere Not and enforce that bugger. It's um, <laughs> it's she's she's trying to drop it, and I'm like, sweetheart. No, okay, <laughs> just give me another. I'm not ready for this yet. I'm definitely not ready for that to go. 
because I need that like oh, even if it's just 45 yeah. minutes for just a I, I hardly ever even even I have that time I hardly ever finish the cup of tea while it's still hot yeah but I want to make a cup of tea and feel like uh. I can do that without someone grabbing at my legs and I want to tidy up a bit and make the dinner for later and make a phone call to HMRC <laughs> which I'm constantly <laughs> doing you know it's those kind of things you just need a little bit of time where you can just focus on some things that need doing instead of always having to look at the little person at the same time it is incredible when you do have an hour or two to do stuff you Another two, Jay. I was just going to say, what world do you have you <laughs> back to back, or do you mean in twenty four hour period? Probably in twenty four hour. You know already what my day's been like. To, it's been like that completely. But yeah, oh like it's a blessing and a curse that right. I'm not with Ray's dad because I get two weekends a month where I've got no childcare. But then it's it, all the, every bit of tiredness and every bit of relax. It just yeah. it, I feel like I've been smacked in the it face with out. everything when she mm. goes. And I do have to allocate a couple of hours of that weekend to really come down. Otherwise, I just yeah. I wouldn't, my nervous system would just give in. Be like, no. There is like that whole like the feeling of needing to decompress. I have mm. that a lot lately. Yeah, well, I think um, that's made I don't know how well I achieve it. But... I mean, God, yeah, yeah, I agree. And the being sort of constantly, I mean, like so touched out, and Thea's oh, at yeah. that age where she literally wants to climb on you all the time. Oh, like she, it's like almost like she wants to be inside my body yeah. still. Like she's trying to literally climb. Like, yes, it's but then it's the, the, it's, it's like you're constantly on on, a, on this weird universe where when they don't touch you and they want to be away from you and they want distance, you feel like, well, why don't you like me anymore? It's really <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> when when you suddenly have you, you realize they've not come to you for like twenty minutes, you're like, oh, can I have a cuddle? And they're like, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> We just what? Yeah, this isn't fair. This is on your terms, babe. Completely. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Completely. Well, like we was watching Drag Race earlier, and she wanted to go on on the new chair separate to me, and I said, "Do you want to come sit next to me?" No. I, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, dagger to the heart. <laughs> dagger to the heart. <laughs> so, when did you start feeling like yourself again? Then, with all of the sort of craziness and. Do you feel like yourself again? I don't think I do. Yeah. I think I feel like an entirely different person. Full stop. If I'm honest. Um, and I go through through phases of feeling entirely lost with myself, and I'm not don't think I've found myself again yet. Um, yeah, I I, I, th- I think that's a really difficult question to answer. I I think physically, I have felt kind of well until I got COVID back in, <laughs> oh. <laughs> back in March. I had you know I was feeling kind of all right. I was getting back to a little bit more work, so there was a little bit of me I was gaining back bit by bit. Um, and then obviously this has all happened and I feel completely lost again, to be honest. Yeah. I don't know who I am really at the moment. No. The person that supplies multiple meals. <laughs> and, I, yeah, I mean, literally about six meals a day yeah. for different people, for different people. Yeah. It would be interesting though. Cause I had my daughter in my twenties. So I've, obviously for the first year or so, like everybody, I felt bingy, but as the years went on, I felt, I felt quite physically strong and stuff. So if I have more children, it'll be a late 30s thing and it will be interesting to see what the effects that will have on my mind and my body, you know, that 10 years on. It... I quite often think, you know, because I'm I've just turned 40, so I was 38. I had just turned 38 when I had Thea. Um, and I definitely f- feel like it's physically harder work mm. than I would have liked it to have been. <laughs> um, you know, all those romantic dreams of teaching her to climb trees and roll down <laughs> hills. And I'm like... Yeah. I can't roll down a hill, babe. I won't go you up have again. To hi- <laughs> just better hire someone for that verity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Should be a service for mums. Yeah. Come and climb trees and roll down hills with my kid. I will look. <laughs> oh, Heather's volunteering. Heather's volunteering. You know Heather's what I mean? Got her hand I, I will look unlovingly from a bench. They, that looks wonderful. I will cheer That's you and absolutely applaud. wonderful, Bab. And buy you an ice cream at Definitely. the end. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely feel like my mum was considered a geriatric mum when she when she had me and she was twenty eight or something. Yeah. Or thirty. I think she was thirty when she had me. So she was considered geriatric in, in that day and age and um and that was ten nearly ten years younger than, than than I was. And I think that does make a huge difference actually. Even when her and I have, have, have talked about things, sometimes she she does often come back to, of course I was ten years younger. <laughs> I'm like, all right, mum, you don't need to rub it in. <laughs> 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 don't I feel it, bloody hell, you know. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question, Verity. What stereotypes about yourself do you see in the media that you hate? I mean, that's a really tough question for me because if I'm completely honest, as a lesbian mum, I don't see myself represented in the media ever, really. 
Mm. I just don't. When do you ever see it? I think there was one Volvo ad that came out earlier this year. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this ad is brilliant. <laughs> purely because it's got two women who are moms. <laughs> like it's Volvo. Like it's not that brilliant. But you know, I just thought that was. Did it, it make you want to buy a Volvo slightly? <laughs> <laughs> ever since. <laughs> was it clever? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, Volvo's not my thing. It's not my jam. It's not sexy. <laughs> you can put lesbian mums on, on it all you like. <laughs> all you like. But it's still, but it's still not buying one. That is still a kind of, that's kind of a negative stereotype still though, right? Yeah. Well, let's put lesbian mums in a Volvo. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't they be in a nice BMW? What's wrong with that? <laughs> but yeah, I, I, if I'm completely honest, I, I genuinely feel like there are plenty of lesbian stereotypes, but lesbian mums, mm. uh, that's not something... I really have seen on the telly or in adverts or it's just not I'd say same with with single parent families male side you know mm. just don't think you see very much of it um, and yet I have got just in, in my local vicinity there's about four or five families with with you know lesbian mums that I know now which is great because it means Thea can see it as something that's a bit more oh. yeah and hopefully there'll be other ones at, the, at whatever school she goes to and that won't be a problem because that's what I worry about more than anything, to be honest. Verity works with our composer, Chris Passy, and she's done all of the arrangements for our songs and she's, um, we wrote a new song together that didn't exist <laughs> <laughs> at the start of this process um so Verity is massively massively important to the sound of the show when you guys get to see it you'll get to hear her magic but we want to know what is your favorite thing about being involved with the good enough moms club um exactly what's happening on this podcast right now <laughs> <laughs> it's just the sort of absolute no holds barred. this is what I rehearse this is genuinely what a rehearsal is like yeah. all the time I think just just being able to lay everything on the table and 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 there being no sort of stigma attached to anything mm. I think that's really awesome uh, it's a bunch of kick-ass women involved in this show and and you know the token male ain't half bad either um <laughs> hold tight the lens <laughs> um I feel like it's such a rare occurrence that you get a bunch of women, let alone women who are also mums together in this industry yeah. <laughs> in one virtual room, even if not a, a fully fleshed room. Um, I, I think it's I think it's something I've never experienced. And that ability then for there to be nothing that's not okay mm. to talk about, um, for you to be able to say, guys, I'm going to be five minutes late because I literally cannot sort my kid out right this moment. That that is That is an immense amount of freedom from the rigidity Aww. that I think you often feel being involved in this industry. And I think that's been the most refreshing thing about it for me. But my favorite thing ever has been the rehearsal we had where we were all on Zoom oh, all together and the kids were all there. <laughs> and all of a sudden we had Thea come into shot and went, wee, 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 wee floor, yeah. wee, wee on dolly, wee, wee on cushion. <laughs> <laughs> wee, wee fucking everywhere, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Literally though, like the, we've said this before. So the, Thea's wet herself. Willow's doing a good wee in the in the corner. So we're all clapping Willow on. Maze is getting an Amazon order. Ray knocks my tea over. Literally, <laughs> it's just like it is the best experience, and it's the most pl amazing place to create in because there's just so much freedom. There's no that like, you don't feel inhibited in any way, shape, or form, and it's just incredible. Yeah. That's something I found actually about being a gay mum mm. as well. Is that even in the IVF process, for example, all the forms that you have to fill out all mention husband <laughs> slash father. Yeah. Husband slash father. That's the only option. And I actually took umbrage with that. I wonder why. <clears throat> normally, I'd just, normally, I'd just kind of let it go. And for some reason, I was obviously having a hormone kick that day. I Too thought, I'm right. going to take this up with the reception and say, can you change this form, please? Because that's we need my partner needs to fill that bit in. And that, those words don't apply to her. And so they actually had to write a the form where they just changed that wording and I sort of thought I can't believe in 2018 as it was then that I'm having to fight that battle you know whenever we used to go away before the baby was born of course we never go away anymore um you'd get you'd get to a hotel and and nine times out of ten at reception when you're checking in they go oh oh um you booked a double should we should we change that to, to, to a twin for you no 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 <laughs> No, 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 we're fine with the double. Thanks. That's what we wanted. That's why we booked it. <laughs> 
Right. Finally, tell us where other mums can follow you and and Sorry, have yeah. this content on, on tap. <laughs> so I'm, but basically, I'm crap at social media. I'm really not very good at it. Um, it I, I'm I'm a private account on Instagram, but I tend to accept people that I have met <laughs> at any time, and um, and I only really post things of Thea because that's my life. Um, but um, I'm on Twitter, just my full name, Verity Quaid, um, and I occasionally tweet vaguely political things. So if you don't like those sort of things, don't bother following. <laughs> because I will back chat you about it so <laughs> Verity thank you so much it's been uh, I've, I've, my abs it's been hilarious <laughs> you see now Jade you don't need to go to the gym today you see <laughs> thanks so much Verity we hope you've all laughed as much as we did <laughs> When you've recovered, you can join the Good Enough Mums Club by following us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram by searching Good Enough Mums Club. We'd love it if you can hit the subscribe button for the podcast, rate and review wherever you listen. And if you know a mum who'd like this, please tell them about it. If the stories in this podcast resonated with you, made you wee a little or even just reassured you that you're doing okay as a mum, you'll love the episodes we have coming up. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Bye. Bye. How will I ever be good enough? When will the loneliness fade? When will it fade away? Why does it have to be so tough?